Hi, my name is Sarah Cox, and I'm the curator of exhibits here at the Elmhurst History Museum. And I'm here to explore the highlights of our latest exhibition, The Bicycle, Two Wheels to Adventure. The exhibition explores the way in which the bicycle influenced manufacturing, infrastructure, and also created a newfound form of leisure for the American public. Before the popularity of this 19th century invention, the idea of a human-powered vehicle came much earlier than the 19th century. The first inkling of a human-powered vehicle came from a French mathematician named Francois Ousnam, who put in a patent into a publication recommending a design for a human-powered vehicle. It would be run by a servant while one rider was on top of the vehicle. While these early ideas were never put into practical uh, applications, uh, the ideas were freely published and often tried to be patented. And it is not until actually 1817 when we see the first person to actually design and implement the first human-powered vehicle. Baron Karl von Dreis of Karlsruhe, Germany was the first to design and practically build the first bicycle. However, it was not called a bicycle. It was called a Luft machine, also known as a running machine. However, predecessors would later call it the Dreising after its inventor. Now, necessity is the mother of invention. And with this, he was looking for some kind of vehicle other than a horse in order to survey the new lands that he had been put in charge of surveying. So in this, he decided to build a two-wheeled vehicle in which you used your feet to push off the ground and move along the land. The highest speed that this got was up to 12 miles per hour, but on average, it was five to six miles per hour. Now, the public did not take to this as a general form of leisure and excitement. They thought of it more as a curiosity. So the idea of the Drazing soon fizzled out. However, Von Drace inspired a generation of engineers, Wainwrights, and musical instrument makers to try and design a more cost-effective and efficient human-powered vehicle. After the popularity of Von Drace's Drazing or Luft machine wore out at the end of 1817, we see this shift in society, a spark you will say, in the imagination of engineers and different mechanics who were trying to look for the new human-powered carriage. So between 1818 and 1869, we see this huge explosion of people publishing their designs for different vehicles, human-powered vehicles, I should say. Um, and the ones I have featured here on our Wheel of Design is really only a handful of some of the designs that were not only published in local publications, but also put into practical use. Some of these people include um, one of the more popular ones is an 1818 Dennis Johnson. His practical use is of the Drazing, in which he changed it to what would be known as the Velocipede. Um, and his nickname for his vehicle was actually the Hobby Horse. He opened schools to try and increase the popularity of the Drazing, or as it was known, the Hobby Horse, um, to get it more uh, popular and in people's minds because they really wanted this to be a practically used vehicle. Um, so his is one of the more popular. Now, later on in 1867, we have Pierre Michaud. He comes the closest to designing what we know today as the bicycle. We have an example of one of his velocipedes here in the exhibit, um, generously on loan. Um, he was the first one to put pedals onto the bicycle. However, he put the pedals onto the front wheel and he had designed a crank system. It was still not perfect, but he came the closest to designing what we understand today as the bicycle. It is not until 1870 where we see the popularity of the first bike really not only become important and interesting in Europe, but also in America, particularly on the East Coast. In 1870, an eight, uh, a British athlete uh, decided that instead of riding the typical bicycle that you'd seen before, the Velocipede, created by Pierre Michaud, instead he was riding what was known as a high wheeler. The high wheel design was created by James Kemp Starley.
who was in Coventry. He was a designer, he was an engineer, and he created this bicycle known as the high wheeler, or as many people call it, the penny farthing. The penny farthing, the nickname, comes from the disparity between the two sizes of two British coins, a penny and a farthing coin. So oftentimes you hear it called a penny farthing bike. Now this took on to not only become an important thing in sports and racing, but also as part of a leisurely activity. In the exhibit, we have photos of people going along Lake Michigan and Chicago, cycling through Lincoln Park Zoo on their high wheel bikes. Now the high wheel bike for its popularity, however, had its own faults. So many people got injured while riding a high wheel bike. If you've ever heard the term taking a header, it came from the invention of the high wheel bike as the most common injury were people flying over the handlebars and injuring their heads. So in an effort to try and create a more safe bike, but also more cost effective, his nephew, John Starley, designed what's known as the safety bicycle simply because it was safer than the high wheel bike. Now, he did that in 1885, and this took over the world by storm. The bicycle was called the Rover Bicycle. Now, with that, at the same time, there were also other inventions that would help out the bicycle, such as pneumatic tires and coasting brakes. And this era starts what was known as the bicycle boom. The bicycle boom began in 1890 and went until 1901. The bicycle boom was a time in which bicycles became more exciting and accessible to both men and women, and it influenced a number of things throughout society. One thing was the accessibility of it. The bicycle boom, with so many manufacturers around, allowed for the price of the bicycle to come down and more people in the middle class to be able to afford it. The biggest impact the bicycle made was on women's independence. Not only were women allowed to go out on their bicycle without a chaperone, they were also able to participate in different activities such as going to their jobs and also the suffragette movement. Susan B. Anthony credits the bicycle for helping women get around to different marches and speeches throughout the town and spread the word of the women's vote during the early 20th century. Another area that it influenced was women's fashion. There are a number of items involved in women's fashion that changed during this time, during the late part of the 19th century. However, with bicycles, it was often tough to ride a bicycle in those big Victorian skirts. So there were often contests held in order to figure out what would be the best outfit to wear. They called it rational clothing. And in the end, it came down to wearing a form of a pair of pants, also known as bloomers. Now, while bicycle manufacturers often made design changes to the bicycle, as you may see on a women's bicycle, that the top line of the frame of the bicycle is often dipped down to account for women's skirts and dresses, even today. But back then, the bloomers became the new outfit, and it's also known as the cycling outfit, which involved instead of lace-up boots, which would get caught in the pedals, they would have button-up boots, they would wear the pants, or also a form of a skirt. they would have a jacket, um, you would often see them in a nice hat as well, so they still kept their femininity while also adopting the masculine pair of pants or a pair of bloomers. What it also did, particularly here in the Chicagoland area, was create a new culture in terms of sports and clubs here in the area. Thanks to the 1893 World Columbian Exhibition, the sport of bicycling became extremely popular. A number of stadiums and cyclodromes opened up in the Chicagoland area. One famous person who came here was Major Taylor. He was the part of the first integrated cycling club and he was able to break a number of world records here in Chicago. While there were some stadiums that would not allow him, he was able to go to the Garfield Park Stadium and break a number of world records. Cycling clubs were also extremely popular here. With over 10,000 members in the Chicagoland area, different towns and nooks and crannies and neighborhoods of the Chicagoland area had their own cycling clubs. They would often have their own houses or places where they would meet, and they would have events where they continued to take their bicycles around the city where they could on the latest paths uh, and adventures across the Chicagoland area.
As mentioned before, Chicago was part of the center of the bicycle boom. And it really was because of one thing, transportation. Chicago had a great hub for trains. Its location next to Lake Michigan made it ideal for shipping. So it made bicycles very accessible here in the Chicagoland area. Between 1890 and 1901, over 400 bicycle manufacturers and shops opened up in the Chicagoland area. With such names as Schwinn Arnold and Company, the Monarch Bicycle Company, Mead Cycling Company, we were able to develop kind of this iconic look to Chicago as the hub for bicycles. We even had a famous street, Lake Street in Chicago, known as Bicycle Row. Now many of these companies, after the bicycle bust in 1901, would eventually either close up, they would sell off other things, or they'd become something else in manufacturing other kind of household goods um, or contributing to the war effort. One company stood out and continued to produce bicycles. That was Arnold Schwinn and Company. We have an example of a later Schwinn bicycle known as the Lemon Crate along with a famous advertiser who went with it and that was Captain Kangaroo. We have that example in our exhibit here. Um, but that was kind of the one mainstay. They even were still able to stay in business during both world wars as they helped the war effort from home on the home front. Now we still see examples and there are collectors out there. One of the things that people do collect are bicycle badges. We do have a few examples of those in the exhibit as well, along with letters from different manufacturers about the production and manufacturing of the bicycles. Now Elmhurst being on two main train lines, uh, it was very accessible for people in Elmhurst to get bicycles. The first bicycle shop we see is Hilliard Plumbing and Bicycle. Not only do they do the plumbing for the town, but they also were selling the bicycles. We have a great and wonderful photo of the family standing outside the shop. We also later had other shops such as Bicycle and Key, the Visser Bike House, and uh, Stemples. Stemples was kind of a mainstay. It had two locations here in Elmhurst. Their last location was close to the Prairie Path, which made it easy for people with flat tires to go in and fill them or fill their other bicycle needs. Russell Stemple was also a staple in our uh, annual parades as well on his tricycle. We also sometimes had high wheel bicycle riders in our uh, in our parades as well, but I know Russell Stemple was a staple um, when it came to that here in Elmhurst. After the bicycle bus, bicycles were still around and people still needed a place to go. So they eventually influenced a lot of the infrastructure that we see here today in the United States and in the Chicagoland area. The first movement to do that was in the early part of the 20th century, and that was the Good Roads Movement. A group called the American League of Wheelmen, along with farmers and politicians, tried to advocate for paved roads because at the time they were dirt roads often left over from the Civil War era. So people were looking for safe places to be able to ride their vehicles, move farm equipment, and eventually the new thing, the vehicle, on roads without them getting stuck, people getting injured and hurt. The Good Roads Movement is important because it also influences our next movement, which is the Rails to Trails. Now, while they were looking for roads for people to drive their cars and move farm equipment, we were also looking for our own paths for bicycles. There are a number of suggestions and we have images of people on how we could work together, especially in Chicago, to have a walking path, a path for the elevated train, and for the increased number of cyclists in the city. However, one way that they were able to do this was through Rails to Trails. Rails to Trails is taking old abandoned railway right-of-ways and transforming them into bicycle paths. Now, the most famous of those is actually right here in Illinois, and it's called the Illinois Prairie Path. The Illinois Prairie Path began because of a letter that May Watts wrote in 1963 to the Chicago Tribune after a trip to England where she noticed that they had a number of paved paths just for bicycles and pedestrians. And she thought that Illinois should have the same. So along with her and a number of volunteers and the cooperation of park districts and the city of Elmhurst, they were able to secure blocks of land of the right of way from the Chicago Aurora Elgin rail line in order to get it cleared up and to get it covered and paved with stone and gravel from the local quarry in order to create the Prairie Path. 
Now the Prairie Path began as 23 miles of uh, traveling for pedestrians, uh, horseback riding, uh, and bicycles. However, today the bicycle, uh, the Illinois Prairie Path, is over 60 miles long. The Prairie Path runs from Maywood to Wheaton. That's the main stem. But today they also have spurs, which were built additionally in the later 1970s. Those would be the Elgin Spur, the Geneva Spur, the Batavia Spur, and the Aurora Spur. Each of these all connecting to the main stem of the Illinois Prairie Path. Today, the Illinois Prairie Path is traveled by many cyclists, including us, who currently have our mini exhibit about bicycle fun facts up until September 5th. Our local artist, Vincent Latestu, illustrated our little J. Hart Rosdale, and throughout the exhibition, he'll be sharing fun facts about bicycles and about himself later on in the exhibition. J. Hart Rosdale is an important figure here in Elmhurst, as he not only influenced the creation of this exhibition, but also he was the world's most traveled man. He was even featured in the Guinness Book of World Records. J. Hart Rosdale, on his bicycle, traveled hundreds of thousands of miles around the world, visiting 222 of the 226 recognized countries between 1937 and 1977. While he didn't take his bicycle, Jacqueline, who was named after an ex-girlfriend, with him on many of these trips, especially later on when air travel became more accessible to him, he still was able to go to amazing places in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia on his bicycle. He even tried to climb the Alps with his bicycle, Jacqueline, and we have a photo of that in our exhibition. Now you can learn more about J. Hart Rosdale in our next talk on August 13th with our curator of collections, Dan Lund. Even today, bicycles still make an impact on society. In one way, starting in the 1970s, when gas prices were extremely high, now mind you, they thought extremely high was $2, um, they wanted to find a more economical way of transportation. Well, they had one right at their hands. It was bicycles. And a large number of campaigns during this time were trying to advocate for the use of bicycles over people's cars. A study done by the University of Oxford said that if you just substitute one of your trips for the day with a bicycle instead of a car, you save up to 67% of the normal emissions that you would let out into the atmosphere. Now, while the car still dominates as the top form of transportation, not only here in the United States, but around the world, there are still many ways in which you can contribute to going green with your bicycle. And we feature a number of those suggestions here in our exhibit. Now, as discussed earlier, J. Hart Rosdale was just one of the many citizens here in the town of Elmhurst that owned a bicycle. We even have evidence as early as 1905 of students taking their new safety bicycles to school on the paved sidewalks here in Elmhurst. Now, Elmhurst was inspired by the popularity of bicycles to create a number of clubs that are still operating today. We have a branch of the Illinois Prairie Path here. We also have the Elmhurst Bicycle Club, the DuPage Cycling Foundation. We also have Ride Illinois, which works with our local bicycling, bicycling groups. And we also have our newest groups, the Walk and Rollers, formed by the city of Elmhurst, who are looking at some of the ways in which they can become a more bicycle-friendly town in terms of the infrastructure. We even have featured our proclamation of official Elmhurst Bicycle Month for the month of May. Now with every exhibition, we always have a call to action. And with this, we hope that it will inspire you to not only get that bicycle out of the garage, but also take advantage of some of the great paths that we have available here in the Chicagoland area. So with our Learn More section, we have plenty of grab and go things such as maps of the Illinois Prairie Path, maps that are available of the Northeastern Illinois District 1 provided by the Secretary of State, and also more information about our local bicycling clubs, which have a number of events throughout the year, including fundraisers and uh, special community rides that anybody can take a part of. Some of these organizations even have memberships. So I encourage you to take a look at these, stop by, see where you can take your bicycle on its next adventure. I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors, Fezzi Roofing, Michael Cicero, Attorney at Law, Lakeside Bank, and especially the Elmhurst Heritage Foundation. The Elmhurst Heritage Foundation helps us fund educational programming and exhibitions here at the Elmhurst History Museum.
We also had a great number of contributors of people who loaned items, who let us borrow photographs, and also shared their stories about bicycles and its history and the importance of the Chicagoland area. I encourage you to come and visit the exhibition. It is open through September 17th, 2023.